All right, let's take a look at practice exam three. All right, so problem number one, we have a simple harmonic motion problem uh, where uh, the model of a spring is given by D equals negative eight cosine of six pi T, where D is in inches and T is in seconds. Uh, find exact answers to each of the following. Maximum displacement, time required for one oscillation and the frequency. So don't get, uh, don't get confused by the fancy words we're throwing in here. We're talking about the maximum displacement. That is just the amplitude. Uh, and if we're talking about the time required for one oscillation, that's just the period. Taking things back to the uh, stuff we did from a few worksheets ago. Uh, just with different names. So if we are interested in the amplitude, we care about the number that's out in front of cosine. And if we're interested in the period, we care about the number uh, that's in front of T. So the amplitude, so just be the absolute value of negative eight, which comes out to eight and that's measured in inches. Uh, and then the period we know is two pi over B, which in this case is six pi. Uh, so that is one third of a second. Uh, and then the new thing that we introduced in simple harmonic motion is the frequency. Uh, but the frequency is just one over the period. Uh, oftentimes we'll use capital T for period. Uh, but so that means we're looking at one over one third, which comes out to three. Uh, and this is gonna be oscillations per second. OSC per sec. Uh, and specifically for the unit that is oscillations per second or inverse seconds, seconds to negative one, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this has a special name uh, that'll be three hertz. Uh, but again, that only shows up for oscillations per second. Uh, if we have other things like oscillations per minute or something, we're just gonna leave that as oscillations per minute or sometimes RPM, revolutions per minute. If you're looking at a car's tachometer, that's what it's measuring. It's the frequency of your engine, you know, fun little tidbits from me, Steve, from you. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Toy rocket is to be launched from the ground aimed toward a big tree on the other side of a privacy fence. Uh, if it's 21 feet from the launching position to the base of the fence, which is nine feet tall, uh, what must be the minimum angle of elevation in whole degrees? So when the rocket is launched, it'll clear the fence. So let's draw ourselves a picture here. Hey, come on. There it goes. Okay. Uh, so we'll give ourselves some flat land here. Uh, I can draw a tree over on the other side. What do we use for a tree? Sure, this color will work. Cool, there's our tree. Uh, somewhere along here, we should have ourselves a privacy fence. Try turning ink to shape on here and get this to work. Hmm, almost. Oh, come on. Fine. We'll do it the old fashioned way. Okay, so we've got a fence that's got to go somewhere. How about a purple fence? Cool, here's our purple fence. We know it's nine feet tall. Uh, and our rocket is somewhere 
off to the side of this thing. And we want to aim it so that it'll hit the tree. Not really drawing this thing to scale, but whatever. All right, and we know what else? Uh, this distance down here, we measure from here to here. That's 21 feet. That's how far away from the fence we are. We want the minimum angle of elevation necessary to clear that fence. Well, don't do that. No. Okay, my tablet froze. Bye oh bye. All right, and we are looking for the angle of elevation. Oh, which will be that angle right there. Uh, as long as we aim just above that angle, we should get over the fence, right? Aim any below that angle and we're definitely gonna hit the fence. Uh, but if we aim somewhere above it, we should make it. At least we have a chance of making it. So if we throw everything together over here, uh, I know the opposite side. I know the adjacent side. I do not know the hypotenuse of that triangle that we just constructed. And I'm interested in the angle. So if I want to put opposite and adjacent together, I'm going to want tangent. So I should have tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. Opposite in this case should be nine over the adjacent side of 21. Uh, meaning that theta is equal to the arctangent of 9 over 21. I won't get fancy just yet. Call it arctangent 9 over 21. You could reduce that and call it you know, 3 over 7. Uh, but, oh well, didn't do that. So throw that into a calculator, and I got... 23.2 degrees. Uh, now this problem in particular had some interesting wording to it. Uh, namely, we wanted the minimum angle and whole degrees that gets over the fence. Uh, so just because of the wording of the problem, we want to round this thing up regardless of the decimal that comes after. So even though the closest whole angle is 23 degrees, if we round down, we're definitely going to hit the fence. Uh, so we have to round up and call it 24 degrees. Uh, because da, 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 da. Uh, minimum angle to clear the fence and whole degrees. So we aren't trying to measure the angle to the top of the fence, we're just trying to get the minimum angle that will get over the fence. Uh, don't expect something that tricky to show up on the exam. You know, everything else on this problem is fine, but that weird rounding thing, I'm not going to care. Or at least I'm not planning on testing you on that. Well, let's see what's next. Uh, we want to find the exact value of the following expression. Uh, the cotangent of the cosine inverse of negative 63 over 65. So let's take a look at what we've got going on here. So I'm taking the cotangent of the inverse cosine. Keep in mind that the inverse cosine is just an angle. Uh, nothing more to it than that. Uh, so I'm looking for the cotangent of some angle, which means if I could construct a reference triangle for said angle, I should be able to get an exact value. Uh, so we're taking the arc cosine of a negative number, which means this thing is in quadrant two. So I'm going to draw a reference triangle over here, making sure to draw it so that it shows up in quadrant two. Throw some coordinate axes on here. 
making sure that we know that that angle right there is alpha measuring from standard position. Whereas, you know, if we were on the inside here, that interior angle is the reference angle. Hey, that's it. Cool, so that's the reference angle on the inside. Not that it comes up in this particular problem, but it is gonna you know, show up in some later problems. Just introducing that idea early, that reference angle is always the angle that's on the inside of the reference triangle. It's kind of where it gets its name. Uh, but let's, I digress. Let's put all the other pieces in here that we're missing. Uh, so we wanted the inverse cosine of negative 63 over 65. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So 63 is the adjacent side, 65 is the hypotenuse. Uh, and because we're in the second quadrant, x should be negative 63. Uh, then we're, we've got a missing side y. I'll label it over there for now. And I can set up an equation. Uh, y squared plus negative 63 squared is equal to 65 squared. Uh, throw all that uh, into a calculator. 65 squared minus 63 squared should be 256. Uh, meaning that y is plus or minus 16. And since we're in the second quadrant, I want the positive y value rather than the negative y value. So y is 16. All right, and finally, we wanted the cotangent of that thing. Cotangent of alpha. That's the label I gave to. That's the label I gave to that angle. Uh, cotangent is adjacent over hypot. Let's try that one more time. Adjacent over opposite, right? It's the reciprocal of regular tangent. Uh, so that's negative sixty-three over sixteen. That's what we'll throw in the box. Uh, nice. And then a multiple choice section, since this is just a, well, it was an old written exam from back in the times that we still had written exams. These questions would be multiple choice questions. Now they're all multiple choice questions. Uh, but yeah. Cool, so let's run through some of this stuff. Uh, we're looking for the exact value of the secant of the arctangent of the square root of three, which means I'm looking for the secant of pi over three. Uh, since the arctangent or the tangent inverse of square root of three is pi over three, and if we go to pi over three, secant is going to be two. Remember that secant is the reciprocal of cosine. Cosine of pi over three is one half. So secant is one over one half, which is two. Uh, we'll work that same magic on the next one down. The arc sine or sine inverse of the tangent of three pi over four is going to be the inverse sine of negative one. Uh, so tangent of anything pi over four is gonna be one or negative one, uh, since sine and cosine have the same value. Uh, and three pi over four is in the second quadrant where tangent is negative. So tangent three pi over four is negative one. Then I want the arc sine of negative one, which by definition 
is negative pi over two. Hopefully that answer is on here somewhere. It is. Uh, after that, uh, finding the exact value or exact values of the arc tangent of negative root three over three. Uh, this is pi over six, but it's negative because it's negative root three over three. Uh, and that is the only answer here. So this one's a bit of a trick question, right? The inverse functions are defined to have only a single output. Uh, so it is only negative pi over six. Uh, even though, you know, if I were to ask the question, if tangent of theta is equal to negative root three over three, then what's theta? Then we could find more answers. Uh, but this is specifically just defined uh, as the inverse tangent or tan in tangent inverse arc tangent of negative root three over three. All right, problem seven, another one that's sort of testing the limits of what the inverse trig functions can do. Uh, so even though we're taking the cosine of negative pi over three, uh, this thing comes out to positive pi over three. We work through the steps here. Uh, the cosine of negative pi over three is positive root three over two. Uh, and then the arc cosine of positive root three over two is pi over three. Uh, so you know, one thing that's maybe worth pointing out, uh, cosine of pi over three and cosine of negative pi over three have the same value. They're both positive root three over two. But if I take the inverse cosine of negative root three over two, I would only get positive pi over three since I need to be in the first quadrant or the second quadrant, but again, it came up positive. So first quadrant. Uh, coming up next, we've got some similar triangles. Uh, A, B, C, and P, Q, R are similar. Find the length of side B. Uh, keeping in mind that side B is gonna be opposite angle B. So it should be this side over here. It is similar to 8.1. Uh, and then we also have 2.7 is similar to 3. So this thing should look like a ratio of sorts. Uh, where I've got B divided by 8.1 is equal to 2.7 divided by three. Let's drop that down a little bit so I don't run into some of the text that's on here. Solve this equation for B. And we get 8.1 times 2.7 divided by three. Uh, which is 2.7 squared, uh, which looks like three to the sixth power. Yeah, three to the sixth power. Three to the sixth is 729. Uh, so move the decimal place over a couple places, 2.7 squared, uh, 7.29 is what I'm trying to get at there. Uh, you, of course, don't need to do that in your head. You can use a calculator. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you should you should get that. I thought cosine of pi over three was one half. Well, <laughs> you'd be correct. Yep, good catch. Uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah. 
Definitely should have been a one half up there, not a root three over two. I don't know where my head was at. Doesn't change the answer though. It's uh, well, I made the same mistake twice, so it ended up canceling out. <laughs> uh, yeah, the answer is still pi over three. Uh, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, cosine of pi over three is definitely definitely one half, uh, not root three over two. Oops. Uh, but all right, let's move this shindig down uh, to the last multiple choice question here on the practice test. And start investigating some stuff. We have an object attached to a coiled spring that is from its rest moving down. A distance of nine millimeters, assume the motion is simple harmonic with a sixth of an oscillation per second. Write the equation that relates the displacement uh, of the object from its rest position after t seconds. Uh, so I suppose we can also highlight the other pieces that are important here. It's going to be those three pieces. Uh, from the Using the words from its rest moving down, uh, we know that this is a negative sine graph. So I can get rid of anything that isn't negative sine. So D is out, B is out. That one's out, and that one's out, right? Those four were all cosine. So I know it's not gonna be one of those functions. Uh, I know that A should be negative nine, but I think every single one of these had A being negative nine, so that doesn't really help us out. Uh, but we know that uh, we're looking for a simple harmonic motion of the sixth of an oscillation per second, which means that B should be equal to two pi divided by one sixth, which is 12 pi. So I'm looking for an answer that has 12 pi t in it. Oh, wait, whoa, slow down, slow down, slow down. Yep, forget everything I just said right there. Mm. Let's change that to a new color. Okay. Try that one more time. We assume that the motion is simple harmonic with a sixth of an oscillation per second. I label it in the wrong color and confused myself. Uh, that means that the frequency is one sixth, right? Not the period. Whoops. Uh, so it's a sixth of an oscillation per second. Uh, so our frequency is one sixth, which means that our period. is gonna be equal to six. The frequency is six, is one over six, then the period is six. Uh, we get that from the reciprocal of one sixth, meaning that B is two pi over six, uh, which is pi over three. Uh, so the option left to us would be this one here in the middle. Okay, there we go. That looks better. Uh, with that out of the way, let's take a look at problem 10. And we've got a runner who begins at the starting line and proceeds. I forget a sentence there. Oh, okay, whatever. A runner is going to be in a race, uh, going to begin at the starting line, proceed in the direction of 72 degrees west of north, 
three and a half kilometers until she reaches the refueling point, then turns 90 degrees southward, running six and a half kilometers to finish the race. Uh, what is the bearing from the starting line to the finish line? All right, so it'd be probably important to have a good vertical line here. Okay, then what did we say? Uh, our runner is going to travel. Does it make sense to go over here? Yeah, sure, over here. Uh, 72 degrees west of north. So we'll turn our ruler 72 degrees to the west. Uh, don't be like me. Make sure you get east and west correct. We're going to be traveling to the left because that's the direction that west is. Um, so come on, right there. Uh, and draw in the first three and a half kilometers that our runner is going to go. Uh, at this point, the runner will turn 90 degrees southward, which ought to be this way. So turning 90 degrees to the south here, I'll put the ruler up here so we can see where we're going with it. Uh, and the runner said what? She's going to go six and a half kilometers this time. Uh, so just make sure that this line is longer than the first one. So 3.5 kilometers up here. And 6.5 kilometers down here. Oh, boy. Six and a half kilometers, three and a half kilometers. All right. And our goal ultimately uh, is to find the bearing from the starting line to the finish line. Uh, so we want to look at this line, right? Or the bearing that goes in that direction, right? From the start to the finish. We kind of label some things over here. That's our starting line. This is our finish line. Uh, and we should throw some stuff in here. Uh, if I remember my colors correctly, I was usually labeling, labeling that first bearing in yellow. And we know that, that was 72 degrees west of north. So we'll go that way. Ultimately, the angle we're interested in is this one, the bearing angle. takes us from the start line to the finish line. Don't forget, bearings always have to be measured from the north-south line. And then I've got this angle on the inside of the triangle that I'll call theta. For clarity's sake, I'm just gonna move this up into the left a little bit. So, if we want to get beta, the bearing angle, uh, we should hopefully notice that uh, I would get 180 degrees if I added up all three angles, the yellow, the green, and the red. So that initial 72 degree bearing angle plus theta, which is the interior angle of that triangle that we constructed plus beta, the bearing angle that I'm hoping to solve for. Uh, so if I want to get beta by itself, 
and figure out what it is, I would first need to know my green angle theta. Uh, so I should set up an equation that'll let me solve for that. Uh, and if we take a look at this particular drawing we made, there's a right angle in the upper left corner, uh, meaning that the two sides I know out of this triangle are the opposite and the adjacent sides. Uh, the hypotenuse is the side I don't know. Uh, which means, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm looking to get my angle theta, I should set up a tangent equation. So the tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So 6.5 over 3.5. Solve that thing for theta, and I get that it should be the arc tangent of 6.5 over 3.5. And if we keep this thing in degree mode, I got 61.70. So pop back up to the top, 180 degrees, minus 72 degrees, minus 61.7 degrees. And I come up with something, 46.3 degrees. So that's the bearing angle. I'll throw that down here in the box, 46.3 degrees. And I just have to attach a cardinal direction to that. Uh, and if I go from the start to the finish, I'm headed in the southwest direction. So southwest, 46.3 degrees west of south. Hopefully we'll not forget our bearing angle or our degree symbol on that angle. Cool, that's our bearing. All right, on to problem 11. Uh, which of the following correctly lists three asymptotes of the equation y equals 53 tangent of 2x? So if we have tangent of theta, uh, then the vertical asymptotes for tangent theta would be theta equals pi over two plus k pi. Uh, so I want to claim that two x is equal to pi over two plus k pi. Next, I just wanna set my angle, the thing that I'm plugging into tangent, the interior of tangent which is 2x, I wanna set that equal to pi over two plus k pi. Solve the thing for x. I get pi over four plus k pi over two. Or if I get a common denominator for that thing, pi plus two k pi over four. Uh, meaning, if I just kind of construct a sequence here, uh, my asymptotes should be pi over four. If I plug in zero for k, then add two, so three pi over four, add two k, two pi again, five pi over four, seven pi over four, nine pi over four. I can keep that going in the other direction as well. So I'm looking at odd multiples of pi divided by four, uh, which means C is gonna be the correct answer. Uh, be careful. Uh, that these asymptotes should all have the equation x equals something. 
Uh, so y equals a number is going to be a horizontal asymptote. Uh, and tangent doesn't have horizontal asymptotes. So whenever we're looking at the equations of vertical asymptotes, they should always be of the form x equals something, assuming we're using the standard x and y axes. Uh, but yeah, don't use y equals, use x equals. Okay. Up next, complete the table for the following functions. Uh, the period, the range, and the general equation of vertical asymptotes. Well, let's start with the period for each of secant and cosecant. They should both have a period of two pi, uh, but don't forget that tangent and cotangent both have a period of just pi. Right, tangent and cotangent repeats the same cycle every half circle rather than needing to go around a complete circle. So they have a smaller period, in fact, exactly half the period of the other four trig functions. Uh, the range then of each of these functions for sine and cosine, the range is just negative one to one. For tangent and cotangent, it's all real numbers. Uh, but for secant and cosecant, I need to take all of the numbers except those in between one and negative one. Uh, so they basically have the opposite range of sine and cosine. Uh, and then for that, general equation of vertical asymptotes. We just looked at tangent x. It was pi over two plus k pi. Uh, secant, which is also a function with a denominator of cosine, right? Tangent uh, and secant both have a denominator of cosine. So they both have the same equation for vertical asymptotes, pi over two plus k pi because cosine is zero at pi over two, uh, but cosecant and cotangent both have sine as a denominator. Uh, so their asymptotes are just at k pi, x equals k pi. Up next, what do we have here? Given the function 10 cosecant of pi over three X uh, minus pi over six, find a bunch of stuff. Uh, so we want the period, the phase shift, the range, and the general equation of vertical asymptotes. Uh, starting with the period, we want two pi divided by b. In this case is pi over three. Uh, and that thing simplifies to six. Up next, I want the phase shift. Uh, the phase shift is c over b. Uh, which is, I don't forget this would be positive pi over six. So pi over six divided by pi over three. I believe that simplifies to one half. Uh, then I'm after. Uh, the range, which is going to be negative infinity to negative 10 because of the, an amplitude of 10. Union, 10 out to infinity. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, the general equation for the transformed vertical asymptotes. Uh, that just means I want to take my interior, which is pi over 3x minus pi over 6. Set that thing equal to k pi and solve it for x. So pi over 3x is equal to pi over 6 plus k pi Come on now. plus k pi. Uh, notice every term has a pi in it. So maybe it's going to be easiest to just divide pi away right now. Call this thing 1 third x equal to 1 over 6 plus k. Plus k, there we go. Uh, meaning that x is equal to 1 half, 1 half plus 3k. All right, and finally, some stuff from worksheet 11. This stuff ought to be fun. So I have the cosine of theta is equal to negative 5 over 7. Uh, and I want all solutions that are between 0 and 2 pi. And we're going to use four decimal places of accuracy. So let's start with finding that reference angle. Uh, so one thing you don't want to forget uh, is that reference angles, uh, anytime I want one of those, uh, it's equal to the, abs the arc cosine or the inverse trig of whatever of the absolute value of whatever I initially had. So I want the arc cosine of positive 5 over 7. And this thing is positive. So add in a couple of notes there. Uh, throw that into, uh, throw that into a calculator. And let's see what we get. I didn't prep this one yet. So let's check it real quick. Arc cosine. Uh, 5 over 7, 0 0.7752 is what I get when I put that in the calculator. Which is that thing. Okay. So up next, cosine is equal to a negative number, uh, which means that theta, hear that negative, uh, which means we should be looking in quadrants two and three. So in quadrant two, Theta is equal to pi minus the reference angle. And in quadrant three, theta is equal to pi plus the reference angle. Uh, so this thing is pi minus. 0 
And this one I've got pi plus 0 0.7752. Hmm. Well, is it my tablet or is it my pen that's not working well? Hard to say. Uh, so throw each of those things into a calculator and we'll see what we get. A minus. Zero point, nope, one more time, point seven seven five two. Two point three six six four. Uh, and if I just change that to be pi plus, three point nine one six eight. So those are the answers that put the box. Three six six four and three point nine one six eight. Uh, going to the chat. Should we be in radians or degrees for this problem? Uh, we're doing this one in radians. Uh, if we highlight. That answer up there. Oh, also it said find all solutions uh, for theta in radian measure, uh, which means we'll want plus 2k pi on each of these, on each of those answers. All right, so we started by finding all solutions between 0 and 2 pi. And then if we want all possible solutions, anything coterminal to either one of those angles would also be a solution to this problem. So we'll add 2k pi to each one. All right, up next, probably we're looking for the same thing, right? Yeah. OK, so we have 5 sine theta minus sine theta times tangent theta equals 0 which means we've got sine theta times five minus tangent theta equals zero. Solving each piece individually, sine theta equals zero or five minus tangent theta equals zero. So on the one hand, I've got theta equals 0 and pi, right? If sine of theta is 0, that happens at 0 and pi. And if 5 minus tangent theta equals 0, that means tangent theta is equal to 5. Uh, so the reference angle is equal to the arc tangent of 5. Uh, and if we throw that in a calculator, Arctan 5, 1.3734. Oops, 1.3734. Uh, wouldn't it be negative still? Negative tangent and negative 5? Yeah, that would also be correct. All right, subtract five over to the other side, negative tangent equals negative five. Uh, but then, you know, multiply both sides by a negative and you get positive tangent equals positive five. So both equations work. Uh, but either way, in order for five minus tangent to be zero, tangent's gonna need to be a positive number. So we've gotta be in the first and third quadrants, Q1 and Q3. In quadrant one, theta and the reference angle are the same. So it's just 1.3734. Uh, and in the third quadrant, 
theta is pi plus that reference angle. So pi plus 1.3734. I'm using red for the reference angle, so I'll color that in. And then go to a calculator to see what we get. Pi plus 1.3734. Uh, 4.5150, yeah. So we're throwing all kinds of stuff up here in the box. Zero, pi, 1.3734, and 4.5150. Five zero. Actually, I'm going to leave that black. And because we're looking for all solutions, each one of these gets a plus two k pi. Uh, since these are all everything that I put down on the paper so far are all the solutions between zero and two pi. In order to get all solutions in their entirety, I just want anything that's coterminal to something in between zero and two pi. All right, then number 16, finding all solutions for theta in zero to two pi. Uh, so this time we don't need to add the two k pi to everything, we just need to find whatever's going on here. So I've got cotangent squared plus three cosecant is three. Solve that thing for theta. So I've got a mix and match of some trig functions right now. So I'm gonna to wanna to use a trig identity, namely the one that says that cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared minus one. Plus three cosecant theta minus three equals zero. Uh, so we'll simplify that thing to be cosecant squared plus three cosecant theta minus four is zero. Factor this thing to get cosecant theta plus four. Uh, let's change that. Cosecant theta minus one times cosecant theta my plus four, zero, which will give us the two equations, cosecant theta equals one, or let's try one more time, cosecant theta minus one equals zero, or cosecant theta plus four equals zero. Uh, so this is cosecant theta equals one, which is only gonna happen at pi over two. On the other side, cosecant theta equals four. So sine theta, oops, negative four. So sine theta is negative one over four. And we'll need to do some fancy stuff in here. Uh, the reference angle. is equal to the arc sine of positive one fourth. Uh, which, let's show that in a calculator, arc sine of 0 0.25, 0 0.2527 radians. Uh, then we have negative sine, so we need the third and the fourth quadrants. Q three and Q four. So I want pi plus the reference angle. 
And I want two pi minus the reference angle. Uh, if I throw that stuff into a calculator, what do we get? Pi plus 0.2527, uh, 3.3943. And if I do 2 pi minus that, 2 pi minus 0 0.2527, 6.0305. Uh, so all that stuff has to go in the box. Pi over 2, 3.3943, and 6.0305. No need for a plus 2k pi this time, though. All right, and finally, I've got secant of 5 theta equals square root of 2, uh, which would be the same thing as cosine of 5 theta equals square root of 2 over 2. So we're looking at positive pi. We're looking at pi over four values in the what? The first and the fourth quadrants. I just hang out and look at that cosine of five theta for a second. I know that if cosine of x is equal to root two over two, that means that x is gonna be pi over four and seven pi over four. Uh, meaning I'm gonna end up with a couple of equations. Five theta is equal to pi over four plus 2k pi. And 5 theta is equal to 7 pi over 4 plus 2k pi. Solve each one of those things for theta. Uh, and we should get pi over 20 plus 2k pi over 5. Uh, or if we simplify that or get a common denominator, I'm looking at pi plus, multiply by four, 8k pi over 20. On the other side, theta is going to be, uh, what is that? Uh, 7 pi plus 8k pi over 20. All right, and I wanted all the answers between zero and two pi, so I should start listing out values in these sequences until I get up to two pi. So starting with the first one, we'd have pi over 20, plus eight will be nine pi over 20, plus eight will be 17 pi over 20, 25 pi over 20, and eight one more time, 33 pi over 20. Notice if I did it once more, I'd get 41 pi over 20, which is more than two pi. So I don't need to include that number. List, uh, listing off the other sequence. I've got seven pi over 20 plus eight, would be 15 pi over 20, plus eight again, 23 pi over 20, plus eight again, 
31 pi over 20 plus eight again, 39 pi over 20. And just for giggles, if I did eight one more time, 47 pi over 20. Uh, but that's also out because it's greater than two pi. So I've got those 10 answers all go in the box.